let's take a look at some formal theories of organization in public administration. Organizational theory deals with the formal structure, internal workings, and external environment of complex human behavior within organizations. The formal study of organizations, which spans fields of business administration, economics, political science, psychology, statistics, sociology, as well as public administration, has evolved for over a century. Numerous hypotheses and research findings have emerged about what motivates workers in different environments and how different incentives affect various tasks, employees, and situations. On one level, they can be distinguished according to whether they concentrate on the needs, objectives, methods, problems, and values of management. Some of these theories overlap to an extent, sharing certain values and viewpoints while differing significantly in other respects. Although formal organizational theory originated in the late 19th century, some formative thinking on the subject dates back many centuries. Most notably, the idea of hierarchy found in the great majority of contemporary organizations springs from these historical roots. Weber's model was intended to identify the components of a well-structured government bureaucracy. He prescribed the following five key elements. The division of labor and functional specialization. Work is divided according to type and purpose, with clear areas of jurisdiction marked out for each working unit and an emphasis on the elimination of overlapping function. Hierarchy. A clear vertical chain of command in which each unit is subordinate to the one above it and superior to the one below it. Formal framework of rules and procedures. Designed to ensure stability, predictability, and impersonality in bureaucratic operations as well as reliability of performance. Maintenance of files and other records. To ensure that actions taken are both appropriate to the situation and consistent with past actions in similar circumstances. Increase in professionalism. Employees are appointed on the basis of their qualifications and job-related skills employed in a career-oriented civil service and paid a regular salary and benefits. The development of Frederick W. Taylor's theory of scientific management marked the beginning of the managerial tradition in organizational theory. The theory of scientific management rested on four underlying values. The first was efficiency in production, which involved obtaining a maximum benefit or gain possible from a given investment of resource. The second was rationality in work procedures, which addressed the arrangement of the work in the most direct relationship to objectives. The third was productivity, which meant maintaining the highest production levels possible. The fourth was profit, which Taylor conceived of as the ultimate objective of everyone within the organization. As they were applied to more organizations, the principles were increasingly criticized as being inconsistent and inapplicable and eventually became outdated by developments in both theory and practice. These developments were not limited to public administration. In particular, new approaches in psychology and sociology focused attention on those who would make up the workforce of an organization. Informal and formal traditions differ from each other in both major assumptions and principal research directions. Formal theories assumed that workers were motivated to maximize their economic gains. Informal theories consider non-economic needs as well. Thus, researchers in the informal school thought to determine which non-economic factors might have an impact on workers and their performance. The first major studies on human relations were conducted at the Western Electric Hawthorne plant in Syria, Illinois between 1927 and 1932. Elton Mayo and his associates at the Harvard Business School intended to measure the effects of worker fatigue on production, but their research was expanded and resulted in a set of findings about motivation, productivity, and other job-related factors not solely based on economic reward. Specifically, the Hawthorne study centered on how workers reacted to actions of management, 
how variations in physical working conditions affected output, and how social interactions among workers affected job performance. The Hawthorne or halo effect is the tendency of those being observed to change their behavior to meet the expectations of researchers or those observing them. The Hawthorne studies paved the way to investigate factors other than formal organizational structure and operation and establish the importance of social structure and worker interaction. These studies became the basis for Human Relations School of Organizational Theory, which stressed the social and psychological dimensions of organization, particularly satisfaction and motivation. A major emphasis in the Human Relations School was the study of organizational leadership and how leadership affected worker behavior and organizational performance. Two of the most influential scholars in the field were Chester Bernard and Kurt Lewin. Bernard examined the nature and authority within organizations, concentrating on leader-follower interaction, while Lewin studied the different leadership styles and their effects on subordinates. Zone of acceptance is the extent to which the follower is willing to be led and obey the leader's directives. The more recent scholars in this field have devoted some attention to shortcomings in the Human Relations School of Organizational Theory. The principal criticisms have revolved around three points. The first and the most commonly noted charge is that this theory fails to take into account the potential for conflict between workers and managers. Second, the Human Relations School seemed to discount the effects of formal structure on members of the organization. Third, the complexity of technologies used in an organization may considerably be more important in shaping informal structure than factors the original researchers regarded as pivotal. Organizational humanism marked a turning point, serving as a bridge between the human relations approach and what we refer to as modern organizational theory. Organizational humanism marked a turning point, serving as a bridge between the human relations approach and modern organizational theory. Organizational humanism was based on several assumptions that differed from organizational theory and the human relations school. The first was work held some intrinsic interest and would serve to motivate the worker to perform it well. According to the second, individuals work to satisfy both off-the-job and on-the-job needs and desires. The third assumption was that the work was a central life interest to the worker, not merely something to be tolerated or endured for intrinsic reward. A fourth assumption, following directly from the notion of the centrality of work and of on-the-job satisfactions, proved to be a harbinger of things to come in contemporary organizational theory. It was assumed that this theory of management was better able to promote positive motivation than to conclude that workers were inherently uninterested in their work and would avoid doing it if possible. Organizational humanists assumed the positive intent of workers after research showed that author authoritarian management practices designed to control lazy and irresponsible employees resulted in frustrated and underperforming workers. Douglas McGregor, who was among the pioneers of organizational humanism, argued that workers could be self-motivating from their own interest in their work and their own inclination to perform it well. McGregor's theory Y was in sharp contrast to what he called theory X, which maintained that workers were lazy, wanted to avoid work, and needed to be forced to do it. Theory Y model of organizational behavior stresses self-motivation, participation, and intrinsic or in internal job rewards. Theory X model of behavior within organizations assumes that workers need to be motivated by external or extrinsic rewards or sanctions, known as punishments. Another major figure among organizational humanists was psychologist Chris Years, who identified the needs of workers to connect with their work as a source of motivation to perform it well. 
He wrote that self-actualizing workers who achieved the highest degree of self-fulfillment on the job through the maximum use of their creative capacities and individual competence and independence. On the other hand, according to Maslow, the worker had a hierarchy of needs in which each level had to be satisfied before the individual could go to the next one. As the worker satisfied the needs of one level, he or she was further motivated to work towards satisfying the needs of the next highest level. Like other formulations in organizational humanism, the hierarchy of needs assumed that worker satisfaction could be affected by many factors in the organization. The nature of tasks also appears to be relevant in explaining the success or failure of organizational humanism in different work situations. Modern organizational theory differs from all previous approaches in four key respects. First, proponents of earlier approaches made quite a few assumptions that were grounded in the predominant economic or social values of the time and that perceived needs of management in labor. Second, modern organization theorists make extensive use of previously unavailable empirical research methods. Third, modern organizational theory is constructed on interdisciplinary basises, broadening the perspectives that can be developed concerning organizational behavior and the management of large, complex enterprises. In the context of modern social science, a system refers to any organized collection of parts united by prescribed interactions and designed for the accomplishment of a specific goal or a general purpose. Closed systems are simple systems that have very few internal variables and relationships among them and little or no vulnerability to forces in the external environment. Open systems theory proceeds from very different logistical premises, which many scholars argue are more appropriate to the study of contemporary organizations than the closed system theory. Open systems are seen as highly complex, interdependent, and overlapping boundaries and characterized by an exception of change and uncertainty internally and externally. An obvious difference between open and closed systems is the way each allows external environments to impact the organization. For example, a private firm will alter its marketing priorities in response to changing consumer preferences. In these instances, those organizations inside are willing to change and their activities to meet externally imposed needs or wants. Also, because open systems continually interact with their environments, there's a constant need to balance pressures and responses, demands and resources, and worker incentives and contribution. All of this long-term interest of organizational stability, which permits continued functioning by leaders, workers, and customers. Information theory is based on the view that organizations require information to prevent them from evolving to a state of chaos or randomness in their operation. Game theory addresses competition among members of an organization for gains or losses in terms of access to resources. Theory Z refers to patterns of organization and operation characteristics of many contemporary Japanese corporations. A management system developed in private industry and based on statistical process control techniques, TQM is aimed at satisfying customer expectations by continuously working across an organization to improve process. The underlying principles in systems analysis and SPC were taught by Americans recruited to assist Japanese companies in rebuilding a war-torn economy following World War II. Public managers realized that performance measurement alone does not necessarily lead to quality improvement. Total quality management is based on internal regulation and worker self-management, commonly known as empowerment. In public administration, quality management is communicated as an attitude that stresses customer satisfaction, improves internal processes, and empowers employees to make decisions. Organizational theories are useful in explaining many aspects of human behavior within organizations. 
although they can't encompass all of the dynamics of actual operations which in, within large and complex enterprises, they suggest a theoretical framework for understanding a wide range of internal variables related to organization design, communication, coordination, and effective leadership style. During daily activities, many possibilities exist for assigning work, communicating objectives, and other similar choices. The way subordinates are regarded by managers affects the styles of communication that are used to convey directives. The application of theory X, Y, or Z would dictate the operating responsibility that management chooses to delegate to others. In most public organizations, proponents of these theories interact simultaneously and often conflict. There are concerns that are part of the dynamics of organizations and affect both individual and group behavior. Two topics can be classified as process issues, communication, a vital function in organizational life, and coordination of activities internally or across organizational boundaries. Both are central not only to, to traditional thinking and effective operation in practice, but also to process of change within organizations. Four other topics to be discussed are appropriately labeled design issues because they're relevant to the formal structuring of organizations. They are first, line, subordinate or policy focused, and staff, support or advisory activities, and how they are related in practical terms. Second, centralization versus decentralization in assigning responsibility and in overseeing operations. Third, the implications of tall versus flat hierarchies for managing a workforce. And finally, the possibilities of alternative forms of an organization itself. Few topics have received more attention in both academic and practitioner literature than communication. In this discussion, communication refers to the field and process of communication whereas the plural communications refers to individual messages sent or received. In the context of large and small groups, interpersonal relations, communication theory, and the general political realm, and even relations between nations, communications has been the focus of intensive research as well as practical application. Every major theory of organization has included explicitly or implicitly assumptions of the nature, roles, and processes of communication in various organizational settings. There are many types of organizational communications. One of the most important distinctions is between formal and informal. Formal communication is official written documentation within the organization including emails, memos, minutes of meetings, and records. They form the framework for organizational intent and activity. Informal communication are all forms of communication other than official written documentation among members of an organization. They supplement official communications within an organization. In a bureaucracy with a vertical chain of command, established communication routes traditionally follow hierarchical lines of authority. A common and increasing phenomenon is lateral or cross-functional communication, which cuts across the vertical hierarchy yet is still connected relatively formally. Upward communication, which goes against the traditional direction of formal channels, is becoming more crucial to effective functioning of organizations. This has a number of important challenges. First, every organization has feedback mechanisms, some means of transmitting information from those who received messages to those who sent them. Feedback mechanisms can range from individual conversations, employee or citizen surveys, or an open door policy by supervisors to their employees. A second factor complicating the feedback process is the strong tendency for good news to travel freely up the line, but for bad news to be suppressed, rooted, or rewritten. To overcome the natural reluctance to report bad news to supervisors, managers can initiate something like a no-fault information policy within some appropriate limits. 
To be successful, such feedback would have to develop in the context of positive, supportive, trust-based interactions between supervisors and subordinates. Negative feedback is often lacking precisely because the organizational relationships that would facilitate it have not developed and been maintained. Upward flows of communication have increased in importance and can contribute measurably to the effective functioning of an organization. Achieving better communication is a goal to which many subscribe, so it may be useful to consider the potential and the pitfalls of public communication. There are several kinds of prerequisites to communication, including the transmitter of a message, the message itself, the medium through which it's sent, and a receiver mechanism of some sort. Considerable research has been done on how the medium and especially the receiver influence understanding of messages sent. Other prerequisites are equally important, including the individual's desire to communicate clearly, a shared interest in achieving common understanding, and organizational arrangements that facilitate message transmittal. This is especially true in a diverse work environment where those involved may lack common definitions of terms employed or shared understanding of concepts and assumptions underlying the information transmitted. The purposes of communication may seem obvious, yet they can be varied as the people communicating. A crisp memo is a weapon of considerable potency in bureaucratic politics. In large organizations, you can be influential through carefully conceived, well-written and brief memos to key decision makers. Obstacles to effective communication can be found among both senders and receivers of messages. Another problem is a lack of accurate or complete relay of a message. The more layers there are in the structure of an organization, the more likely it is that messages will be distorted. A third obstacle is failure of the receiver to listen or to read, a human failing related to our tendency to screen out negative or unwanted information. Still another problem is the failure of the receiver to act appropriately on the message if he or she fails to comprehend its importance fully. One remedy is formal training and communication skills for all employees. Another is more specifically targeted training for higher level managers designed to help them monitor message passing through their divisions. The consequences of communication, like its purpose, cannot simply be assumed. Although many people think that better communication will solve problems and conflicts, that's not necessarily true. The communication process in public bureaucracies generally occur within the context of what some have labeled the bargaining or conflict model of communication. An alternative model of communication that's equally relevant to public administration merits some attention. Communication should be open and clearly inclined towards sharing rather than guarding information, even if doing so leads to recognition of disagreements. This importance in terms of differences is critical to public communication. There are some relative problems of achieving organizational goals. The chances of reaching consensus and the sensitivity of information that would be shared if the consensus building model is used. Other concerns could include the need for political support, the agency's credibility, and the reliability of potential allies as working partners. Like communication, the concept of coordination has almost universal appeal in the abstract. Obviously, a large and complex organization must be minimally coordinated in its activities to achieve consistency in the impacts of those activities. Coordination problems become more serious as organizations undergo growth, increase in complexity, or cope with external threats. Most definitions of coordination emphasize ideas like common goals and interests, compatible objectives, and harmonious collaboration among different groups. We can consider coordination in light of prerequisites, purposes, obstacles, remedies, and consequences as we did with communication. As far as purposes are concerned, there are probably less variety in the objectives of those who desire coordination. 
It should be noted, however, that many individuals and groups may resist would-be coordinators' efforts to clear away perceived difficulty. For their own reasons and priorities, some people, both inside and outside of organizations, may prefer to engage in their assigned activities without bending their purposes to some larger, better coordinated undertaking. One obstacle is differing perceptions of program goals. This, in turn, leads to varied degrees of commitment to coordination process that assumes substantial goal consensus among major participants. Other obstacles are divergent preferences on implementation, conflicting priorities, unequal fiscal capabilities, conflicting political pressures, and poor organization. Coordinating across organizational, include, including governmental boundaries, is more difficult than intra-organizational communication. In the abstract, there's every reason to hope that better communication on objectives, tactics, perceived problems or opportunities can lead to a better coordination among agencies to their activities. Another remedy for coordination problems is the exercise of leadership in at least two important ways. First, responsible managers can devote leadership resources in support of coordination, clearly demonstrating their concern for improving it. This can include building consensus for common goals or resolving internal disputes. Second, managers of different organizations or agencies can initiate efforts to coordinate activities of their respected entities. Organizational arrangements for strengthening coordination fall in two principal categories. One is central coordination in which decisions are rendered by a coordinate entity or individual. The other is mutual adjustment, sometimes termed lateral coordination, which involves consultation, sharing of information, and negotiating among equals. A combination of these may also exist, a process in which lateral coordination is expediated and facilitated by a higher level coordinator. In more complex organizations, the greater challenge that it is to those who would achieve coordination of activity among its parts. The notions of line functions and staff functions in an organization can be traced back to very traditional treatments of formal organization. They deal with programs or policies having direct impact on outside clienteles and are ultimately accountable to a superior in the performance of substantive responsibilities. Staff functions were originally defined as consisting of advisory activities supporting the ability of line personnel to carry out their duty. These could be, for example, financial and budgetary, personnel administration, planning, purchasing, and legal counsel. Line personnel are usually concerned with the immediate and substantive aspects of activity. Those emerged in longer ranged planning typically concern themselves with where the agency may be going in five or 10 years. Several areas of interaction among functions are important in public administration organizations. First, the activities of such diverse units in any organization require some degree of coordination. Second, some kinds of conflicts between the different types of personnel are virtually unavoidable. Finally, these traditional distinctions are increasingly seen as less important in an era of rapid change inside and outside of organizations. Reciprocal understanding is growing, blurring old distinctions between line and staff. As societal demands and management techniques have changed, the distinctions between line and staff functions have become increasingly less significant. The degree of centralization in an organization affects all other aspects of organizational life. Traditional management approaches have stressed how top managers exercise their powers in the interest of economy, efficiency, or effectiveness. Especially in recent years, however, much has been said, written, and accomplished in support of the value of decentralization in administration. Decentralization is an organizational pattern focused on distributing power broadly within an organization. In its extreme form, centralized management means that all essential decision making and implementation are concentrated responsibility of those at the top of the organizational hierarchy. 
Nothing of any consequence goes on that is not under the direct control of top management. Some entities still function this way, but many others at all levels of government and in the private sector do not. The decentralization of decision-making authority effectively responds to employee interest in having a larger voice without forcing top management to relinquish command authority or oversight capacity. Although ultimate policy and administrative responsibility remain with top managers, many day-to-day -day operating decisions are delegated to others at lower ranks within the organization. These issues are central to the continuing debate over American federalism, as well as to specific forms of administrative organization. Initiatives aimed at reinventing government stressed employee empowerment, teamwork, participatory management, labor management cooperation, customer service, and employee enrichment and engagement programs. Clearly, effective control, internal program consistency, and accountability are enhanced by centralization. If authority is highly centralized, there can be little question as to whose values and assumptions shape organizational goals. On the other hand, centralization often carries with it a certain lack of flexibility and adaptability, especially in large organizations. In the age of diversity and change, one of the advantages of decentralization is that it enables middle-level managers in the field to act as organizational sensors, able to detect new problems or opportunities in a position to respond on the spot to a particular policy need. In many settings, the need for this sort of adaptive capability is so great that it demands some sacrifice of centralized control. In short, the most important need is an organization's ability to adapt itself for survival amid uncertainty and change. Another function served by decentralization pertains to a political philosophical question. To what degree are members of an organization or other system meaningful participants in the affairs of governance? Political systems, both ancient and modern, have confronted this question and responded in many different ways. In a democratic system, suspension of centralist control runs very deep. Promoting may e equate to decentralization in government with popular rule in one form or another. In our society, the doctrine has recently been to join theories about organizational life. In general, it's thought that democratic participation enhances the quality of decisions reached and increases the probability that those affected will accept those decisions. Here again, however, there's another side of the coin. In a decentralized organization, it will be more difficult to hold accountable those who actually make the decisions. Most people associate bureaucracy with a distinct vertical chain of command through which essential tasks are effectively coordinated. Tall hierarchies evolved out of a combination of criticisms and organizational factors present in many early bureaucracies. The principle known as span of control combined with task diversity and interdependence of activities to exchange the overall growth of tall hierarchy. The fact that higher level employees in nearly every organization were regarded as more professional than those at lower levels led to the tendency to differentiate between top and bottom in organizational structure. There's a growing complexity of internal tasks and expanded capabilities of internet communication and information technologies to connect with external environments. A flat hierarchy is one in which top management is conducted in a collegial board of directors fashion or all units below the highest level are regarded as hierarchical equals or both. An early example of a flat hierarchy was the commission system in some local governments in which each commissioner was equal and the responsibility for mutual municipal leadership was shared evenly. Communication problems in a tall hierarchy is one of the more prominent differences between the two structures. In general, the more layers an organization has, the less likely it is for its messages to reach all levels and that they're understood. Obviously, these problems are greater in taller hierarchies and create the very real possibility that many employees will be alienated from organizational leadership. 
Finally, issues of centralization and decentralization are more pressing in tall than flat hierarchies. Flat hierarchies are not without their drawbacks. If organizational tasks become more diverse, there may not be enough flexibility in the structure among individuals and staff that are too closely crowded together. A second possible disadvantage lies in the existence of interpersonal hostilities on the same operating level of a flat hierarchy. Finally, flat hierarchies, particularly in smaller organizational settings, have some sort of chain of command. They could produce too many leaders and not enough followers. Neither structure is free from problems, and the choices that are made can predictably affect the life of the organization. Traditionally, bureaucratic organizations singled the division of labor, specialization, and an absence of functional overlap. Another set of issues that's emerged to challenge the most basic assumptions about the appropriateness of bureaucracy as an organizing principle. Specifically, three developments have taken place that encourage informed thinking about alternatives to bureaucracy as a form of organization. First, the availability of technologies such as smartphones, broadband, and Wi-Fi has significantly expanded the capability to perform substantive tasks in both public and private organizations. Scientific and other professional research and expertise have affected so much of public policy making that it's difficult to imagine things like climate change, transportation, agriculture, urban planning, or national defense without them. The technologies involved in operating an organization have themselves given rise to new specialties in the field of management and the development of software to respond. The result has been a proliferation of new collaborative and cross-functional units devoted to functions that were unknown in most organizations just a few years ago. Second, the growth of complex knowledge has been characterized by increasing interdependence of fields of knowledge. Interdependent teams of experts acting as consultants to industry or government organizations are increasingly common. In these situations, hierarchical channels of authority would be highly dysfunctional and tend to interfere with the accomplishment of stated objectives. Other organization forms have also needed to be developed. Third, the rise of professionalism in many occupations has triggered an emphasis of professionalism itself in public organizational activities. Consequently, this has strengthened the organizational tendencies towards diversity and created the need for different styles of management among diverse professionals. Some claim that professionalism might have made bureaucratic hierarchy somewhat inappropriate as a principle of organization. 